Thank you, everybody. As already mentioned, my name is Tim, and I would like to talk to you today about rolling out Prometheus exporters with Puppet. Um, a brief introduction. I go by Bastafreak on the internet. You can find me on, on GitHub, Twitter, and various other platforms. I'm heavily using Puppet since around 2012, and I'm very, very active in the Puppet community named Vox Populi since around 2015. Who of you has heard about Vox Populi? Okay, that's like 60% maybe. That's quite good. Um, okay, let us go on a monitoring journey. Every journey needs a starting point, so we need to make some assumptions here. First one, let's assume that we all maintain a few thousand servers. Physical servers, virtual machines, cloud resources that you rented on AWS, or maybe you are a cloud provider, doesn't matter. We have a few thousand servers. And somewhere in our company is at least one person that claims to be a developer, and he writes custom software, and sadly we are responsible for hosting this software in production. Um, this happens from time to time and it's always a bit painful. Monitoring is always complicated. Monitoring is often bad, especially in our situation. Um, the monitoring that we have produces a lot of false positives. Um, it is inefficient. Um, it's very hard to maintain. Or maybe we don't have any monitoring at all. That's basically the same. Does any of those points sound familiar to any one of you? A few, okay. So, first chapter, the exploration, the happy face. We all noticed our monitoring is bad. We have many, many servers. We need to monitor those servers. So what do we do as a very responsible system administrator or DevOps engineer or however we, what we claim to be? We attend our most favorite monitoring conference, for example, something in Nuremberg. Um, and some person maybe recommends to us the famous node exporter. Who of you has heard about node exporter? Very good. I should do more questions. That's a good training for your arms. Um, okay. Um, people often say, well, that's a Go binary. You can find it on GitHub. Just download it, run it as root, and it will provide you some metrics. Um, that sounds very easy, uh, but also a bit scary. And let's try this out. If I find my terminal. Okay. So... Um, I just skipped the downloading thing because Wi-Fi is, well, Wi-Fi. Um, awesome. So there is no something running at a TCP port. It provides a certain endpoint, and we can accept this. Nope. Awesome. So node exporter is running. Talk is basically done. Awesome. Um, so, node exporter, uh, very nice output. There is always a metric. A metric can have a value. There might be some explanation about what this metric does. And if it's a very good software, there is also something like a type definition. Um, yeah, that's the node exporter. And you can see I can scroll here for a very, very long time, and it takes very long to reach the end of the page. So there are many, many metrics available. So let's try to find out how many values we actually have. Oops. Okay, so accessing with curl works as well. Can everybody see this in the back? Might be so. We have around 703 actual values that we get from the node exporter, uh, just with the default configuration. I didn't configure anything at all. I just downloaded the binary earlier, um, executed it locally, and I already get 703 metrics. Um, that's pretty good. That's a nice starting point. Um, everybody's happy with this. If you take a deeper look at the metrics, you notice that maybe 90% are not relevant for your infrastructure at all, but it's always good to have them. Oops. Okay. 
So um, the node exporter works pretty, pretty simple. It reads a bunch of values. Um, it exposes them locally via an HTTP interface uh, that you can pull. Um, it doesn't provide any authentication or encryption like HTTPS. Um, that's bad if you like security, but it also makes the daemon smaller. It has um, less code that could be attacked, so there are always some trade-offs. Um, there are many collectors available in the node exporter documentation that you can enable and disable, for example, scraping your lo local ARP cache, um, getting information about the used file system, stuff like this. Nice. So this is a list of all the uh, export, no, of all the collectors that you can enable and disable within the node exporter. So there is a bunch of stuff that can generate metrics for you. Um, also a very nice feature that you can generate um, data um, in the same format, throw it into a text file, and the node exporter will just read the text file and present the data as well via HTTP. Um, Downloading random binaries from the internet is very scary. Please don't do this. Uh, this might be recommended in many, many documentations, but no, that's that's bad. Um, check out for, for custom repos or build the software on your own and create custom packages. That's always a very, very good approach. Um, and we've come up there, perfect. So, after attending a conference and getting in touch with the node exporter, um, we often get the impression that it's it's an actual very, very good software to, to monitor physical machines, to monitor virtual machines, um, any boxes that we have. That's pretty, pretty nice. But it's also important to monitor services, as we learned in the talk before here. Um, so we somehow need to get metrics from the application that we are uh, operating for this person that claims to be a developer. Um, if we take a look at the different software that we have in-house, um, we often notice that a framework is used. If a framework isn't used, you might want to throw the custom software away and build it from scratch again. And um, yeah, frameworks are always a good approach. Um, there are many, many frameworks available. For example, in the Java environment, there is the uh, Spring framework, and the Spring framework um, has built-in support for Prometheus metrics, uh, like many, many other frameworks as well. So um, it might be pretty easy to get metrics from your in-house custom software that you have. Uh, it might be a single config option that you just need to enable during runtime or during the compilation. Um, also pretty easy to enrich the data that you um, expose with the node exporter or any other exporter that you find. Um, for example, with the mentioned text files, um, you can en enrich it with data from your IP management that you have in-house or from ServiceNow, whatever you have, or just random cron jobs or systemd timers that generate text files that you feed into the exporter. Um, and you maybe already um, found out that many software that you run, um, open source stuff, um, provides Prometheus style metrics by default. Um, Kubernetes, for example, is probably the, the most famous one. And there are hundreds of different exporters available that you can check out to monitor all the different applications that you might have. And we can check that out as well. So um, that's a list of all the different exporters that um, are officially uh, listed on the internet. And there is a bunch available for different databases um, to monitor very, very different uh, hardware vendors, issue trackers, messaging systems. So there are exporters available for almost everything. Um, if you still would like to write a known exporter that's still very, very easy. The Prometheus people provide um, Go templates if you would like to write something in Go. 
um, but there are also many documentation available for um, custom exporters written in different languages. Nope. So, um, we all agree on that going on the, the Prometheus style might be the, the best approach that we could go um, to create a new monitoring for all the thousands of systems that we have. So we now need to think about how we can integrate the new software into our environment. Prometheus works on a pull approach, um, as you might can think of. Um, there is a central database, um, the Prometheus daemon, and it connects to all the different exporters that might be available and scrapes them on a defined time interval. For example, every five seconds, every 10 seconds, every minute, whatever you think might be a good approach. To roll out the node exporter, um, you just need a single line of puppet code, uh, which is very, very neat. The Vox Profudi people provide a very, very good puppet module um, called Prometheus that can not only configure the Prometheus database, but also, I think, around 20 different exporters. Adding support for another ex uh, exporter is also very, very easy. And yeah, you just need a single line of puppet code to just deploy it. That's very nice. Um, as it turns out, it might be not so nice um, because the deployed exporter is publicly available on the internet. So um, everybody can now access your metrics, which is nice if you, if you like distributed backups from other people. Um, depending on the uh, content of the metrics, that might not be the best idea, and this somehow needs to be um, secured. And um, the Prometheus server somehow needs to get a list of all the targets that it should scrape. Um, most people like to hire a student for this. Um, it, it maintains a long text file with IP addresses, and the Prometheus server iterates on the list of IP addresses, and, well, that doesn't scale very, very good. Um, students normally leave the company if they have to do um, such jobs. Um, it's it, it leads to a bunch of errors, so this somehow needs to be automated as well. There is a very fancy approach um, that we can go here. Um, Prometheus supports um, service discovery, for example, connecting to a Zookeeper or a um, console service, a console cluster, and it can get a bunch of targets from the um, service registry and um, scrape all the services that it can get. So the approach that we can go here is to set up um, a small console instance, and again, that's just a single binary that you could download from the internet and run as root, but maybe you should not do this. Um, and instead package it properly and deploy it. And afterwards, you can register every of the exporters that we deployed to the console cluster and say the cluster, hey, I'm available on this IP, on that TCP port, have fun accessing me. So, and the whole diagram would look like this. <coughs> um, there is a node exporter running on a box or any other exporter that we would like to deploy or our custom application that provides Prometheus style metrics. Um, it talks to a local console agent and tells it uh, on which IP it is accessible. Those information are feeded into a console cluster of more than three nodes, but my slide was too small for more than three, so yeah. Um, and somewhere in the box, running the Prometheus agent, again talking to a local console agent and asking it like, hey, please provide me a list with all the IP addresses. Console talks to the cluster again, forwards those information to Prometheus. Prometheus know, um, knows the IP addresses and can directly talk to the node exporter. Um, seems to be a bit more complex than just downloading random binaries from the internet, um, but still this looks like something that could be implemented pretty, pretty easily. And we have an example that we could maybe show. 
So we have a bunch of puppet code here. Um, we basically start uh, defining a config hash that we can later feed onto the console. Um, IP addresses where the console agent should bind to um, its custom host name um, that will be represented to the cluster. Afterwards, we can deploy the console agent itself, and afterwards define a service. Whoops. And this service basically tells the console service registry. Um, the fully qualified host name where a service is available, the port where it will be available, and it will also define a local check which um, console uses to ensure that the node exporter is still available. Yeah, and in this case, since uh, the console agent is running uh, on localhost next to every exporter, we can just go on and talk to localhost plain text and check every 10 seconds if the node exporter is still available. Uh, if it's not available, um, console can send us notifications. So this is a very neat approach to implement monitoring for the monitoring solution, uh, which isn't a bad idea. So um, we now have a diagram in our head. We know how we can connect all the different services together. Um, we also have service discovery in place, so the Prometheus ASIN knows how to talk to the different exporters, but we still need authentication. So <coughs> happily, um, someone rolled out Puppet uh, on all our systems. That's an assumption we also need to make. Um, Puppet works on a client-server model, and every agent has custom TLS client certificates. Um, Puppet ships a complete private key infrastructure, and um, we can make use of this and reuse the whole certificates, which is very, very easy. Um, again, as I mentioned, the exporter is well, plain text, it doesn't support any encryption at all, but we can deploy an Nginx in front of it on each box and just bind the exporter to localhost. And the Nginx can require or enforce actually TLS certificates for every incoming connection that for, for every system that would like to talk to the node exporter. Um, and it cannot only enforce TLS, TLS, but it can also require a client certificate. This means that Nginx can check if the Prometheus database connects to the node exporter with a valid certificate. And um, yeah, by implementing this, we can ensure that uh, only boxes that we like are able to talk to our different exporters or custom applications that provide those metrics for us. Um, again, there is a very, very neat Puppet module um, to manage Nginx that we can use to um, deploy all the stuff that I just mentioned. And there is some example code as well. So what are we doing here? Um, we have very simple setup for the uh, exporter as well. In this case, I um, just define custom variables that I would like to read in text files. Um, not so important for this demo, but I also tell it to just run on localhost um, and on the default TCP port that it normally uses. I tell Puppet to include the uh, Nginx module. Afterwards, we need to copy a bunch of custom certificates that are all coming from the Puppet directory to Nginx directories, so Nginx is able to read the certificates. And at the end, we define a very, very basic Nginx vhost. Um, the most important 
bits are here at the end. Um, we tell the Nginx viewers to read all the custom certificates and private keys that are coming from our Puppet agent so we can do proper TLS connections. And we are also enforcing um, TLS client certificates with the last variable that we have here. In this case, the Nginx will accept any valid certificate. So in theory, every system where a Puppet agent is installed could talk to this Nginx instance, um, but you could also update the configuration to just accept a very, very specific common names, for example, from the Prometheus database, as I mentioned earlier. So our node export is now deployed. It's now properly secured with authentication and encryption. Um, sadly, we will notice that um, console itself um, ships with no authentication at all in the default. Um, but we can do a very, very similar approach here with console as well, because it also supports um, custom TLS client certificates and a secret key that we can define in the config file. Um, yeah, so that's uh, very, very similar to um, putting Nginx in front. Firewalling. So it's nice that we have authentication in place, but it still might be a very, very good idea to do some actual firewalling with IP tables on the nodes so that the Nginx or the Prometheus database or console or whatever we will deploy is properly firewalled and only accessible from the systems where we want it to be. Firewalling should always be automated. Um, manual work costs a lot of time. Um, manual work doesn't make any fun, um, most important reason, but it also leads to a bunch of errors. Um, and yeah, nobody likes to debug, debug broken firewall rules at 3 a.m. in the morning. Also, IP addresses might change very, very often. Um, if you have a business that's, that grows pretty, pretty good, uh, we might constantly add new boxes to our um, system that we would like to monitor, so, so we would constantly need to update firewall rules. Um, also, in a very big company, there might be cases where a box will be reprovisioned, um, so the IP address is still reachable, um, but the box might serve a completely different purpose. Um, and especially if you're using a cloud environment like AWS, um, you have a bunch of floating IPs that will be changed or routed to different boxes, so you also would need to update firewalling. Again, Puppet um, supports something called exported resources that we can use uh, in this case. Um, the above example code, um, is something that would be executed on the actual database host or every database, every Prometheus database host that we have. And it will define a firewall rule uh, and save it somewhere in Puppet. Um, that's this part. Um, but it will just define it with the IP address from the Prometheus database, but the rule will not be applied on the Prometheus database. Instead, every system where the node exporter is running, in our case, um, would collect this firewall rule from the Puppet ecosystem and deploy it on the node exporter itself. So um, this converges very, very good and easily. Um, every system where we will install a Prometheus database will generate a firewall rule it will not apply it locally, but those rules will be forwarded to every system where the node exporter is running. The node exporter will import the rule, apply it locally, and therefore allow every Prometheus database to access the node exporter. Also very, very neat, skates very good. And again, the Vox Populi people have a nice puppet module for this available to manage your firewall rules with FAM. As it turns out, firewalling for console is a bit more complicated. The 
recommended approach for console is that an agent is installed on every system that needs to interact with console. So services talk to a console that runs on, on localhost. So we need to deploy it basically on every machine. Um, and also console creates a mesh network. That means that every agent, no matter if it's running in a client or in a server mode for console, needs to talk to every other agent. If we have 4,000 servers, that means we need to create 3,999 IP tables routes just to allow every other console instance to access the system. This leads to a bunch of errors or issues that we need to fight against. Um, who have you ever maintained IP table sets with 10,000 IP addresses or more? Nobody. One, okay. I'm sorry for you. So, <laughs> so um, IP tables doesn't scale very, very good with a bunch of rules. Uh, the more rules you add, the slower IP tables get. Um, you might not notice this with around 4,000 systems, but maybe if you add like 10,000 rules or 50,000 rules and somewhere there's a bottleneck and restarting IP tables and applying all the rules after a change uh, might need one minute or five minutes or 20 minutes just to apply all the firewall rules. Um, also, depending on the structure of the rules, every incoming packet needs to go through most of the rules until it finds a rule that matches uh, and this also leads to an increased time to proceed for every packet. Um, there is a solution, um, happily. There is a very nice kernel feature called IP sets. Uh, we can feed into the Linux kernel a bunch of IP addresses or IP ranges and tell the kernel to save those IP addresses as a, ha uh, as a hash map and for every incoming packet into one of our IP tables chains, we can tell IP tables to check the source or destination address of this specific packet against the hash map that's saved in the kernel. Uh, you cannot mix IPv4 and IPv6 in one hash map, but that's not so bad. We can just create a second hash map, one for v6 only and one for IPv4. Um, and updating the hash map scales pretty good. Um, it really doesn't matter how many IP addresses you add to an IP set. Um, adding more IP addresses doesn't slow. It, uh, adding more IP addresses to an IP set doesn't slow it down. Uh, and also, you don't need to update your IP tables rules if you update the hash map in the kernel. And again, we have a nice example. Again, defining this in Puppet um, is pretty, pretty easy. Um, we somewhere need to get all the IP addresses that we would like to the hash map. For example, we do a Hira lookup or read a text file, talk to any database, talk to our IP management enterprise solution that we bought for way too much money, uh, anything. Um, Puppet somehow needs to get all the IP addresses. Uh, afterwards, we need to check that this is just IPv6 or IPv4, so we can feed this to a single hash map. Um, defining this also is pretty, pretty easily. Afterwards, um, it makes sense to create a custom IP tables chain uh, to forward all the related packets into. Um, we need to define another rule in the input chain that tells IP tables to forward packets to the custom chain. In this case, we match on all the ports and protocols that uh, console uses for its normal agent-to-agent -agent communication. And last but not least, we just tell IP tables to check the packets against the IP set that we defined earlier. Yeah. And we have a nice hack at the end. Um, if we go on with th uh, such an approach, um, it might be the case that the IP address list that we got earlier from wherever, example, for from a custom text file, might not be complete. And that we have systems running somewhere with an IP address that we don't know anymore, or that's not tracked on our IPAM or whatever. Um, but we still want those systems to um, talk properly to our Prometheus database and the other way around. Um, 
in such a, such a situation, we can just check if the IP address from the client is not in the list. Um, that would be this fancy unless statement. Afterwards, we can again create custom exported resources that tell any other system like, hey, I'm not in the IP tables list, um, so you won't find me in the hash map that we defined earlier, but you can just again create custom IP tables rules for me to allow me accessing your console agents. Um, and if you think again about the diagram or the, of the architecture that I showed earlier, everything should be now complete and we could come to a very short conclusion. Um, and it would be that rolling out Prometheus export is pretty, pretty easy. Um, in this is example, I only used the node exporter, but this works pretty, pretty good with other exporters as well. Um, deploying the default configuration for a dev environment just is a single line of Puppet code. Um, if you would like to configure stuff that might be a bit longer, but it's still pretty, pretty easy. The Puppet module for Prometheus supports around 20 exporters. Adding more exporters is also pretty easy. Console as service discovery works pretty good. Um, on the positive side, on the negative side, setting it up um, just to provide a way for Prometheus to talk to an exporter is way more complicated than setting up the actual exporters. So um, this was a very, very short walkthrough and I could now try to set up a demo environment to actually prove that all this stuff that I said works. Um, I prepared a little vagrant environment. Um, nope. Oops. Depending on the Wi-Fi quality, this needs two to 20 minutes. You never know. Um, I will show you the code later. This Vagrant instance basically will now set up a simple console cluster, Prometheus database, a puppet server so we can get um, certificates, deploy the node exporter on localhost, and afterwards install Nginx in front of it as a TLS reverse proxy. This might take some time. In the meantime, are there already any questions that I could answer? Thanks, Stu. Good catch. Orange, it's one? Okay. Um, oh sorry, English. Uh, how do you manage updates of the exporters if you have several ones? Do you just subscribe to GitHub release notifications and do it manually, or do you have any automation? Uh, depends a bit on the operating system. Um, in my case, um, on, in the company I'm working for, we actually have around th 3,000 systems. Um, around 150 of them are Arch Linux based, and um, the Arch Linux developers provide packages for all the exporters that we need. That's easy, so I just need to update the operating system and I get the newest versions. Um, the majority of the other systems are Red Hat based and in this case, uh, I'm subscribed to the GitHub release pages to get notified. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, can you show again the uh, code where the uh, Prometheus server implements the jobs from uh, found from the console registry? Sure. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we can take a look at the code that will be deployed in my demo. Can you read that in the back? Or is that too small? It's okay. Okay. Um, bu 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 So the Prometheus setup is pretty simple. Um, wow. So that should be the related uh, parts to talk to a service discovery. Um, 
there is an option console SD configs. Um, again, I tell the Prometheus server that there is a console agent available on localhost that it can talk to. Uh, it should check in this case only for services that are named node exporter and it can talk to console via HTTP because well, that's fine on localhost. And afterwards, um, I tell Prometheus um, for this service that it found via console, it should um, scrape them every 10 seconds via HTTPS and it should use, um, again, custom certificates. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, sure. <coughs> Are there any other questions? <laughs> ah, yes. Quick question. Uh, you mentioned that you want to improve the security of uh, the uh, access to the node exporters. Um, if you have a shared system like shared hosting, which I suppose you have in your environment, how do you prohibit local users with SSH access from accessing your local node exporters? Uh, I would probably try to implement IP tables rules to prohibit this, or depending on the system, might also be possible to use SA Linux um, to enforce this or to create uh, a custom network namespace where you can, um, well, isolate all the different users. Um, so they all can talk to an IP address that's called localhost, um, but in reality it's a different one. And also the IP address range on the loopback interface is pretty wide. So you could just f bind the node exporter not to 127.0.0.1, but to 0.0.2 two, for example, and um, use this IP address for firewalling. That also makes a lot of stuff easier. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> Not the case. Okay. Um, okay, demo is still working. It's downloading stuff from the internet. It didn't fail yet. That's good. Um, so we can take a closer look to the rest of the code that's used uh, in this demo. So um, the demo starts by setting up the uh, Apple repository because that, that's required on the CentOS machine to get a bunch of packages um, that we would like to use. Afterwards, we install all the mentioned packages. After that, done. Uh, I am deploying the Puppet server on my box, so I have uh, ability to get proper TLS client certificates for all the systems. And again, those configuration options are mostly default. Um, doing a yum install Puppet server would probably do the same. Afterwards, the console agent gets deployed, in this case um, also as a server that should be defined somewhere. Yes. Um, my laptop um, is not a 19-inch 19, 19 rack, so uh, I won't deploy a full console cluster with seven nodes, um, but just a single instance um, that works pretty good as a demo. Um, and again, console will be told to use um, custom certificates that are available on the box because I installed the uh, Puppet setup earlier. Um, the private key from the certificate needs to be copied from the Puppet directory to the console directory. Afterwards, um, the Prometheus server will be deployed in the code that I just showed earlier. Dun, dun, dun. And there are a bunch of Puppet file resources, again, to copy all the certificates, again, into the Prometheus uh, directory. And in the demo, I use the node exporter with all the collectors that I could find in summer make uh, sense, just to get more metrics, and um, tell it, again, to just listen on localhost and use the latest version. And Nginx requires a few as alien options to be turned on so it can talk to a local TCP socket. Yeah. And as I just showed earlier, again, there is an Nginx vhost defined um, that will be listened in front of the node exporter um, 
terminate uh, TLS connections and enforce it and require a valid certificate. And at the end, there is a console service definition. And we will do some firewalling with FAM and IP sets. Yeah. Oh, it's almost finished. That's very, very good. Um, so there should be a server up and running with everything that I would like to access. If we have enough time, we could also try to deploy a custom client so we get more metrics and I could try to prove that my firewalling setup actually works. In the meantime, Awesome, so the Prometheus database is installed in the VM I just deployed and I can access it via port forwarding. And if I search for any metric, for example, load, I should be able to find a single system. And I have a fancy graph. That's a pretty short one because I just deployed the system. But um, yeah, that means that the uh, all the code I just showed you somehow at least works and is able to provide the whole setup as I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Are there any other questions that came up now? No questions. Everybody happy or maybe confused? Very good. So, um, This presentation showed that, well, rolling out any export is pretty, pretty easy. Um, most of the frameworks that are used for custom applications support already Prometheus style metrics that could also be monitored. Um, doing proper authentication and firewalling takes a bit of time, but it's also manageable, uh, especially if you're using Puppet. Um, if you're interested uh, in the talk or in the working demo, you can check out the GitHub repository that contains the Vagrant file that I just used locally. And uh, yeah, I think that's it from my part and thanks for your attention. Thank you.